Welcome to the Uncut Podcast. I'm Pastor Luke. And I am Pastor Cameron. And this is the Uncut Podcast, where we have uncut, honest conversations about faith, life, and ministry. So, Cameron, we're sitting down today. We were kind of talking a few minutes ago of, like, what should we sit down to talk about? We had all kinds of topics. To we did. We were <clears throat> talking about maybe talking about politics, which we will most definitely talk about this year because literally everyone's going to talk about politics this year. And we have a sermon series planned on we it. We got a sermon series planned on it. So we will be talking about politics, um, but just probably not today. Today didn't feel like the day for that. Yep. Mm-hmm. So we decided to come down and talk about the broad topic of emotional health. Emotional health. Specifically, maybe in leadership. But also, yeah. just across the board. Yeah. Um, some of that was brought out because yesterday, yes, you sat in on a conversation, mm-hmm. online conversation. I was hoping to, and I was got tied up at a meeting and couldn't get there. But a Zoom call with Crosspoint Ministry. Yep. Executive Director Cliff. I almost said his name wrong. He's a good <laughs> friend of mine, uh, Cliff Roth, mm-hmm. uh, talking about the um, essentially the topic of emotional health and trust and leadership. Yep. So why don't we kind of sp- let you talk a little bit about that that Zoom call, mm-hmm. and then we can maybe springboard and some topics off of that. Yep. So, I think – so the first is it was kind of a – one, it was a really great, I think it's a really good, um, they're calling it the Trustworthy Leader Seminar. And, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to be kind of talking about these different topics. I think they're meeting once a quarter to talk about different topics that are important to people becoming and growing into trustworthy, strong, reliable leaders. Um, and the topic yesterday was about the leader's emotional health. And they kind of started off by giving a definition for what are emotions. Now, I don't have my notes in front of me, so I'm not going to be able to remember the exact definition that they gave, but I really liked how they said it, is that emotions are messengers Mm -hmm. of relational need. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they said messengers. Messengers is my own, I think, way I like, like, because I feel, feel like it's a little bit more... Uh, but they, it's something they had something in there that was like messenger. I just mm-hmm. can't remember the exact wording. Mm-hmm. Um, but they communicate something. Mm-hmm. They tell us something. Mm-hmm. They come with a message about a need we have that is relational in some nature. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we kind of went in and talked about needs, needs of. Ooh, kind of needs of mattering and needs of, hmm, I want to say like security or safety or something like that. I remember the four subs seen, safe, secure, and another one. See, I didn't bring my notes down in front. You go get your notes? No, no, it's okay. fine. Um, but so we all have these like, these needs that we kind of need relationally from people. Um, so the premise then is that all of our emotions are, they are rooted in relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Or, or they're rooted in the topic of relationship, the soil of relationship, mm-hmm. maybe. Um, we should, that should be, that should be copyrighted. Needs are rooted in Mm. the soil of relationships. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah. So it in some way, shape or form is going to reveal an emotional need Yes. or a relational need Mm -hmm. that you have. Yes. Okay. Need needs to be met relationally somehow, okay. mm-hmm. right? Um, and then we talked a little bit about how emotions are maybe closer to the body than they are closer to the mind. Mm. Um, and What is meant by that? Well, the meaning by that is that we, like, 
we feel emotions before we cognitively understand them. And emotions, I didn't know this for a very long time. And and so there are people who were like me who live life and never really actually pay attention to the fact that emotions cause physical things inside of your body. Mm -hmm. And actually one of the best ways to identify emotions sometimes is through paying attention to your physical sensations. If you're stressed or your shoulders all hunched, if you're angry, is your gut kind of like kind of all knotted up? Is your chest kind of coming in on yourself? Like, are you wanting to clench something or you're, is you're kind of getting that like sense of tears and stuff like that? Like what is all of those physical sensations telling us about the emotion that we're having? Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's rarely does somebody like not, you know, we can definitely think things that will make us sad, but sometimes and probably often times something happens we feel sad before we've even thought through what it is that's making us sad or what it is that we're feeling we feel a sensation we right. feel something right and we feel it primarily in our we're tar- we're tired we're lethargic mm-hmm. we're you know and it doesn't it, it doesn't actually it takes us a while to articulate how the body is expressing the yep. actual emotion until we come to a point of saying, oh, I'm sad today. Yep. I'm not fatigued, just fatigued. I'm, I'm just not tired. I'm just tired. You know, I've got sadness yep. today mm-hmm. or something like that. Have you read Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score? No. It's been on my to-read list for several years and I've not gotten to it. Yeah, if you're out there and you're – really interested in the topic of emotional health mm-hmm. and in particular how um, how your physical body is a um, is the soil no relations relationships with the soil <laughs> <laughs> that your physical body um, is the storing place right of memory emotions, mm-hmm. feelings, yep. and how the things that happen in your body are representative of the things that are happening currently to you or have happened in the past. Mm-hmm. Like we have trauma responses, yep. you know, when you... Certain days of the year that you might feel upset for a reason you don't cognitively recognize, mm-hmm. but your body recognizes as being the anniversary of something. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, or when you walk into a particular room mm-hmm. and you get chills. Yep. Or you go into, um, you know, for a long time I had a physical stress response in my body to a particularly like regularly scheduled meeting that I had to have mm-hmm. where I would sit in the meeting and like physic like my core would physically shake almost like i was shivering like i was cold Mm -hmm. and it took me a long time to recognize what was happening there that i my my body was having even though i wasn't necessarily stressed up here or anxious up here but that my body was having a stress response Mm -hmm. to just being in this meeting again yep even though it wasn't anything the same meeting it wasn't the same meeting um, it wasn't the same topics of conversation. Yep. It wasn't the same issues. Right. But my body was like, I want to tell you that this is stressful. Mm-hmm. We've been stressed here before. Right. We've been anxious here before. Mm-hmm. Listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, so yeah, Bessel van der Kolk, K-O-L-K, the body keeps the score. Mm-hmm. Pretty much the gold standard of like the physical storing of trauma and yeah. emotions in the body. Mm-hmm. Excellent book. Yeah. It's been very influential. I feel like in the last, I don't know how old it is now, but yeah, it's been very influential across multiple fields. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, we kind of talked about emotions being closer to our bodies than potentially even our minds mm-hmm. and then shared language around emotions. Talked about chip Dodds, uh, 
I didn't write down his emotions. So even if I had my notes, I couldn't remember them. Mm-hmm. But his emotions that he kind of lists mm-hmm. um, as kind of creating a shared language. Mm-hmm. And then a way to uh, kind of handle emotions and kind of just like process through them. That was kind of the, the topics that we kind of talked about. So what mm-hmm. what were the... Are you pulling up Chip Dodd's emotions? The eight feelings. The eight feelings. From Voice of the Heart. Yep. Chip Dodd has lonely, angry, glad, fear, shame, guilt, hurt, and sad. Mm-hmm. And then kind of in the same, in a parallel track, is the eight needs mm. to be seen, mm-hmm. to be soothed, to be safe, to be secure. To be significant, mm-hmm. to be competent, to be controlled, to be affirmed. There you go. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So you felt like that it was a helpful conversation at least, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think anytime we can consolidate thinking into kind of helpful paradigms and kind of remind ourselves of what are good what are like best practices and how Mm -hmm. to help people kind of work through those Um, and even help our, help my own self work through them. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause like we're all dealing with our emotional health. Well, at least we should be dealing with our emotional health Um, Mm -hmm. and we're trying to manage it somehow. Yeah. Um, What, what do you think, like what's your opinion on why in at least it's my perception mm -hmm. that in recent years, and I will say, I would say I've recognized it more in the last eight to 10 years. Mm-hmm. Why do you think there has been a resurgence of or a larger focus on emotional health? Mm. Like by using these types of terms and understandings, yeah. understanding, you know, the, 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 um, I don't know if it's the resurgence or maybe it's the like prominence now of trauma Mm -hmm. and trauma responses. And sometimes it, you know, we a a little bit tongue in cheek say things like, um, you know, triggering, right. Being triggered. Mm -hmm. uh, Although it does have actual like application in our lives. Yeah. You literally that I was triggered in that meeting right? and a trauma response ensued. Um, But like, but like why, why, like what is the new, why is it happening now? And is that just my perception that there's been a resurgence of it in the last eight to 10 years? Is the timeline different than that or what? Um, in your experience, I think I'm going to say something, I'm going to quote, or I'm going to talk about something that I don't know enough about, but I'm going to sound smart anyways like part of me wonders if it has to do kind kind of a little bit with like speech act theory kind of playing itself out in by that maybe i don't actually understand speech act theory but this idea that we you know you ever heard like eskimos have like i don't know like a ridiculous amount of names for different types of snow yeah 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 (laughs) <laughs> have you not? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> okay. But I, I get the concept. Yeah. yeah. They, uh-huh. they have more in their language, native language, they have more names for snow than we do. We're like, oh, it's snowing or it's flurrying. And then that's about it. They've got like different types of snow that are like wet. Like they have, you know, we say, oh, this is a really wet snow or we're kind of got clunk, but they've got very specific language, like words to describe that. Gotcha. Or uh, <laughs> there was a joke in... Uh, a Simpsons episode where like Lisa's making something up on stage, but she talks about, Oh, and my people have like a name for that thing that happens when you run into the person and then you both try to stutter to go the other way to get out of each other's name. Like mm-hmm. that's a thing that we all universally know that we don't have a name for mm-hmm. when you have a name for a thing, you're able to more fully understand, experience, quantify and express the thing mm-hmm. And so as we've developed around like just a shared language to talk about these things, that means that we're ta- we're able to talk about it more. Mm-hmm. 
and it brings a greater awareness to it, even though the thing may have always existed, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like you can, um, Mm -hmm. like PTSD, you know, um, back in, I think, World War, I think in the World Wars, um, and even before that, they would describe soldiers as having shell shock or um, mm-hmm. there's even older terms than that. And they had a whole bunch of like derogatory things to say about sh- soldiers who were experiencing that. It wasn't until they kind of like began to understand it as something more complex than that. Um, so I think part of it is, is just that the more people research it, the more people publish and put stuff out there and more people read, the more people talk about it, the more people are able to identify and name what's happening, even though it's been happening all all, all along. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. But. Yeah. I just, I think it describes what has happened, but I don't think it answers why now. Yeah. I don't know. Like, was it just a cultural moment? Is there is there something that happened in culture that was like, is this coming out of like a, I mean, I suppose that if it was going to come out of like a post-war type of culture that that would have happened probably after World War II, but then you have Vietnam, and mm-hmm. you certainly have people who like really any generation um, that has experienced a war or a conflict, there's been a significant amount of PTSD or those suffering from those symptoms afterwards. Yeah. Um, and was it just now that we were ready to talk about it in a new way? Are we a, are we a more emotionally aware um, culture now than we were then? Mm. Or I think uh, maybe some of those the questions that I yeah have I think maybe we're kind of tired of old coping. Mm-hmm. Like I think like I notice in myself. Um, I think like a frustration with, um, like a frustration with how like, oh, like just suck up, suck, suck it up and deal with it. Like that's kind of at least the attitude I feel like previous generations have had. And that seems to have led to a lot of generational dysfunction, um, and there's a general desire, I think younger generations, even than me, are, like, very fixated on authenticity. And so, like, we want what's real, and we don't want to just kind of take, um, we don't want to just pretend, I guess, that everything's okay. So, I don't know. Yeah, and, and maybe, like, honestly, I just don't, maybe I'm not even qualified to even answer the question as to why we're... Well, I think it's, you know, it's, I, I'm not, it can be, I think it's okay to have conjecture about opinion about whether it is or what has happened, I don't know, mm-hmm. like, because, um, you know, you'll, I think I've experienced that some people will see it as an actually a negative thing, that yes. we're a more emotional culture now, mm-hmm. and we're... And they will say things like, we we didn't care about all that emotional stuff in our generation. Yeah. We just pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps we just, and went out and did it. Yeah. You know? Or they'll say, we lived by um, certain values and traditions and philosophies, and those held us up to not even, you know. In, in a way, they're not wrong. Yeah, in a way, they're not wrong. In, in a way, they're not wrong. I think like... I, I do think that there is a there is a different emotional landscape among the generation now than there would have been after like I gotta say like sixty or seventy years ago if I want to hit the time, right timeline because we're getting older that there would have been like sixty seventy even eighty years ago is is a different world that's in now and there are different core values of culture and there are different like orienting principles of culture Mm -hmm. that there are then now than there were then and i and i and i don't necessarily think that we have obviously some directions that we've moved as a culture have been positive yeah right um but i think that the that there's a there is a general sense that morally and ethically and if from a value-based 
um, perspective that we are in trouble. Yes. That we are like, we are in trouble. Yes. Um, and that's a theological, that would be a theological statement too. Yes. It's like we are moving at mock speed yeah. into wickedness um, in what, what I think is an eschatological preparation for the coming of Jesus. Right. You know? Um, yeah. And that, um, and so what was the connection now I was going to make until like emotional health coming up? Oh, it's just that, um, you know, I think that there is a, I, I think that the, that the tide is rising on people's personal capacity to successfully process, cope with and hide the generational emotionally traumatic events mm-hmm. that have shaped who we are. Yeah. And so it forces for for those who for those who want to essentially escape the matrix and be even moderately Mm self-aware about what's going on inside of me as I live in this culture, in this world now, it requires that I be a little bit more curious as to why am I feeling like I'm feeling? Right. And how do I change how I'm feeling? Yeah. Um, So. You know, the way you said that makes me do, I I will offer maybe an answer as to why. I think we're reaching a, I think we're reaching a place of like, hyper individualism like we're pushing more and more because like you hear i hear people saying like oh i just need to speak my truth Mm -hmm. or like you know when you talk about kind of moral decay all of that kind of stuff is like well all of that's been removed from traditions and things external and have been put into what do you say about yourself nobody can tell you about you Mm mm-hmm you can only tell yourself or tell the world about you. And that's actually really soul crushing in a lot of ways um, to be entirely self-defined as an existential like nightmare. Um, And, and so by being in this hyper individualistic culture, like more and more we're turning inward. So I think that's part of it. And then you mentioned that kind of like, because not everybody sees all of this emotional health and psychobabble as positive. They'd say, you know, oh, it's making us all in the snowflakes. Yep. Um, which I've had that conversation. Why, what would you say to that? What would you say to that, Cameron, if I came up to you and I said, Cameron, like, talking about emotional health and all that stuff, like, that's just making you into a snowflake. Like, you just got to, like, get over it. Um, I would say that even good things taken to extremes become bad things. Mm -hmm. And I think that talking about emotional health is no exception to that rule Mm -hmm. that it can certainly be, it can certainly become like a paralyzing conversation Mm -hmm. where you, you really do get lost in the, um, pursuit of mm-hmm. emotional emotional I, I would call it emotionalism yes um, almost idolatrous t- towards it um, and I understand what people think say when they when they talk about like well you're just overly emotional and this psycho babble and mm-hmm. um What's interesting to me about it is that those those types of comments usually come from people who would equate emotionalism with the emotions of sadness, crying, um, very ex- uh, emotions that are 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 external and and seem to be soft. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of like their description of wokeness and softness, like that person is obviously very angry Mm -hmm. 
They are very disillusioned. Yeah. They are very frustrated. Mm -hmm. All of them are emotions. Right. And and they're just the emotions that you've labeled as being weak or okay or. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like we, you know, one person will get chided for being an emo- like emotion emotional and crying all the time mm-hmm. by the person who and, and the person who's saying it is just angry, angry all, all the time. time. Yeah. Um as if they're not emotional. Yeah. I'm not emotional, I'm just angry. Okay. <laughs> um I say that a lot actually. Um <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to talk about it. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, but well, I mean, because they're, I mean, literally that you're, you're almost always mm-hmm. going to have an emotion that is more prominent in your life yeah. than others. And I was just talking to my counselor the other day who happens to be the guy that was running here yes. mm-hmm. and, and my, and he reminded me that my most prominent emotion in all of life, good and bad is anger. Mm-hmm. I operate on an ang like from the emotion of anger. And my anger is also the source of my passion. Mm-hmm. It's also the source of my, like, the things that I'm really good at and that are positive in life. It's mm-hmm. the thing that drives me towards justice. It's the thing that drives me towards wanting to do a good job. It's the thing that drives me towards wanting to see people transformed through relationship with Jesus Christ is because I'm angry. Yeah. All right? And so, um, but of course... Emotions also have a very, very negative side to it. Anger has a negative side. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, so to, for someone to say, yeah, no, we, we, like, why are you so wrapped up in emotionalism and all of that? I would say it's short sighted. It ignores their own emotional response to the situation as it stands. But it also ignores or denies the reality that God has created us as holistic beings, which mm-hmm. we've talked about a lot mm-hmm. here, that we are not just bodies that move around like, you know, mm-hmm. robots in the flesh. <laughs> um, we are not just souls. Yeah. Right. We are not just minds, that we are created holistically, meaning that our mind, our body, and our soul is... They are integrally ink linked with one another in a way that cannot be separated in this mm-hmm. life. Um, and so to say, you know, you shouldn't be emotional is to say to a person, like, you shouldn't recognize that part of your humanity. Mm-hmm. There's parts of you that are not okay. Yeah. There are parts of you that are not good. Yeah. Um, and... I don't think that that is neither the heart of God or particularly like effective or helpful. No, I don't think so either. Um, I think like the thing I would say to somebody who's kind of coming with that objection of like, you know, like I do think that there is that extreme where um, I was looking on my phone because I wanted to be able to, attribute this to the right Mm -hmm. person. But uh, Dr. Richard Schwartz, um, who was the developer of like internal family systems, Mm -hmm. he wrote a leadership book and I can't find the leadership book or remember the name of the leadership book, but he talks about empathy being a really strong and really good emotion, but done in excess, a really dangerous emotion. Say that again? Empathy being a good emotion, Mm -hmm. but in excess, it's a really dangerous emotion. Yeah. And by that, he means that, like, okay, well, if someone, you're have Cameron, you come in, you're having a bad day. And if I over empathize with you, now you're having a bad now day. Now I'm having a bad day. Yep. And now the whole office is having a bad day, right? Because I was like, oh, Cameron, like, how are you, what, what's going on? And so all of a sudden, like, we're all just having a bad day. Now I did the nice thing of validating your experience. But I also solidified, perhaps by over empathizing and over validating, that there's nothing you can do to have a better day. Yeah, it's, it's, it's codependency. Yeah, that's classic codependency. It's co- codependency, yeah, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. And so he, you know, warns of like, you know, yeah, we need to validate and like, yeah, maybe you're having a crummy day, but the truth is, is you don't have to have the rest of your day be crummy. Mm-hmm. Like holding on to that truth and calling people out of it. But if we live in a world where you get to speak your own truth and no one gets to 
speak into you or call you out of mm-hmm. it and like you're the decider of your own fate and will and all of that then well no i can't speak into your life and say oh well do you just have you can try and have a better day i can't say that mm-hmm. because what if that's not your truth right correct so that is where it does fall apart and becomes unhealthy but i would say you and i have both explored our own emotional health and found significant benefit to it in leadership and in just life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why do you feel like it's so essential to leadership? This is probably the last question we have mm-hmm. time for today, but um, we're barely getting to the topic we said we were going to talk about, but. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. I think the one that is coming to mind most easily is that when we are not in tune with our own emotional health um, or aware of our own emotional patterns Mm -hmm. as leaders, we end up doing damage to the people that we lead. Yeah. We end up hurting them. Um, Not always intentionally, Mm -hmm. but um, unintentionally. And we... Um, we lead as co- codependently. Mm-hmm. We actually lead in such a way that we do damage to ourselves because we're not we're not um, aware of our emotional the, the emotional landscape of our mm-hmm. of our lives. We can become codependent on if we were to use our context here, become codependent on our congregation's approval right of us rather than on God's call. Oh, I did a lives. really good job this week because lots of people like my sermon. Right. But if I don't get a lot of feedback or I get negative feedback, then maybe I should quit. Right. I didn't do a good job. Right. Or I you know, where right. that 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 I mean, some of that is like you're gonna have a little bit of that naturally sure. in all in you know, whether yeah. if you're even if you're super emotionally well balanced, right. Criticism it's does always not always sting. feel good. Yeah. Right. Um but what happens then, just to use that as an example, is it makes us call into question our deeper core values or mm. our our legitimacy as or our like our personhood, right? Or whether or not God has truly called us. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, maybe I'm not meant to be a pastor. Maybe God doesn't have a calling right. on my life, or it sends us into spirals of shame, mm-hmm. or. Um, or it makes us really angry and then we lash out at criticism Mm -hmm. when maybe that criticism is legitimate. Yep. Or we're a terrible leader because we end up becoming like the uh, preachers who want to, what is it, tickle the ears of the listeners, Mm -hmm. right? We're like, we're afraid to say anything that somebody might react negatively to, even if it is the word of the Lord. Itching ears. Itching ears. Yeah. Yeah. And so that now all of a sudden you're not a leader, you're a like you're a follower. Yeah, you're you, a follower. Yeah, you follow you, of your flock. Exactly. You're no longer shepherding. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah, that, that would be the 30 second answer to that. Yeah. Question. I think that's a it, it there's a lot of practicality of yeah. things like that. Maybe in fact, why don't we call this part one? Yeah. And we'll call part two why it's important. I'm going to talk from the church perspective because that's what I know. Uh-huh. Uh, why is it important to be emotionally self-aware as yeah. a leader? Oh, I think, yeah, because it, it it does. Like you, we are. Your emotions are impacting you, whether you're acknowledging it or not, and they're impacting the people around you. Yes, yeah. I like. I've reflected a lot on the phrase of like, you can only give what you have. Mm-hmm. Like. If you are angry and anxious, mm-hmm. and um, that's all you're going to be able to give to people mm-hmm. at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. You can't give what you do not possess. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's a really, really true statement I found in life that, mm-hmm. like, if I want to bring a, like, if I want to lead people, like, and the thing is, is that that plays out in our spiritual life too. Mm-hmm. Like, we need to be, we need to be possessing Christ and be in Christ, so that we can minister Christ to people. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I'm just doing it out of my flesh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And and part of that 
is working with your emotions with Great. Jesus. Correct. Yep. So. Well, why don't you tune in for part two if you want to hear or if you're interested in hearing the rest of this conversation about like why it is important and maybe some of the practical reasons. Or I can I can share some stories. Uh, I can share lots of stories uh, about. Uh, how emotional health has affected leadership and mm-hmm. affects churches and stuff yeah. like that. So, yeah. And if you have questions about this topic, let us know so we can answer them. Yeah, send them into our text line, 716-201-0507, or you can leave them, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can leave them in the comments there, um, or um, wherever you're listening. You know, We ask you to like this, uh, the, like our podcast, not like... Please like us, but no, like press the like button yeah. and the share button. And subscribe, subscribe if you can. That would be great. Um, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time.